617-445-1061. Today is August 6th, and we are in the studio on the morning show. Joined by Jamal Crawford, say good morning, and then we're going to let our caller, who has been patiently awaiting her turn to speak. All right, all right. Good morning, good morning. Let me find out you've got a radio voice. Go ahead, caller, you're live. Thank you. Now, library scientists, usually if they're in into youth services, they're actually supposed to study the developmental ages of young people, and they're supposed to cater to that. And they're supposed to understand the developmental, you know, areas and stages of young people. And so, A, the fact that they don't, didn't sound like they were very welcoming. They almost sounded like they didn't want them there, which is the sense that I'm getting. Um, shows me that there, you know, it, it, it kind of um, says that there's a tone that's taking over that library. And I also feel like maybe this is something that should be boycotted. You can't come here and be a library scientist in Grove Hall and not be appreciative to the young people that are there. Oh, it's music to my ears. Mm -hmm. There's a way that you need to talk to our people. Right. You need to be nice. Because there are suburban communities with, you know, children of different backgrounds, and they can make, they can raise all kinds of cane in their libraries, which mm -hmm. they do. There are children in other communities that are allowed, and they're not spoken to disrespectfully, and they're not kicked out. All of a sudden, everybody has an understanding of how, you know, just young people interact, and they know how to talk to them, et cetera, et cetera, and they just cater to that. So I'm just thinking, are you getting young people that went into this World Call Library and must have sent something even deeper? Because, you know, our young people are often not treated right and spoken to right. Mm -hmm. So for them to actually come to the part where they say something means that they really weren't treated right. And even when you went down there to get information and to have a conversation with them, they're throwing a piece of paper at you. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. well, don't you get to talk to us like that. Thank you, Andrea. See, Andrea, the difference with me is this. I'm not tolerating it. There's a big difference. And most people, black or white, know I will get in your butt if I have to. Now, don't don't turn me the wrong way because I'm always courteous, Andrea. I walked in there, spoke with a very soft voice. I like to find out who is the director. Uh, he's right there. He, he goes to the copy machine. He's sitting there looking at me, seeing the kids go by. He's looking at me. Never moved, Andrea. He, and I, yes, I'll give him his benefit of the doubt. Mr. Evans may have had things to do. But I'm sitting in the first seat in front of his desk. So he had to know I was there for him. And then the way he wanted to speak to me. I told him, just hold it. Time out. First things first. Let's have a modicum of respect and decorum between each other. These young people did not expect me to come down here with them today. But I'm here to put you and the library on notice that this type of behavior, bad, good, or indifferent, either way is not going to be tolerated because I'll go to these young people's parents and talk to them if they're that disruptive in this library. But at the same time, there is a way, and you just broke it down perfectly. I'll just leave it where you left it because I got Faye Morrison coming up, and this is really important with some news that yes. Andrina, thank you so much for your call. I truly appreciate it. You're listening to The Morning Show here on Touch 106.1 FM. Uh, Jamal Crawford is in studio. We will get to him shortly, but Faye Morrison has a very pressing schedule, and I wanted to get her. This is her time. Good morning, Faye. How are you? Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, I'm hot today, but but I'm hot every day. You know that. Faye. Well, I hear that some people in a place where they should be able to go and drive up to me and uh, listen to the library when I was young and didn't feel welcome there. Mm -hmm. and that's sad to hear. I, and Faye, I want our children in the library. God, if I can keep out of the street and keep them in books, this is great. Read all that you want to read. Go in there. If, whenever my God children are in there, I'm Jamal, Jamal Crawford sitting there laughing, laughing with me. But every, t every time my, my God children from 14 to 7 go in there, they know I'm with them anyway. But they're quiet. I say, excuse me, you know, and I give them the speech before we walk in, the same speech you got from your parents. You know how to act in here. 
And these people at the library tell me, these are the best behaved children I've ever seen. First, they're the first set of black children I've ever seen walking here. Uh, and white children are acting out, screaming at their parents and so forth. Not all of them are not paying with a broad brush. Mine aren't acting like that. But go ahead. Let's get to where we're going. You have um, you, you have some major, major news coming up from, for us, right? Well, I wanted to talk about, you know, the March on Washington, which is quickly coming up. Quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I know people are mobilizing all over the country. And just talk about an event that I'm participating in that's the lead up to that march um, on the 22nd of August. Um, and we're having a... A nonviolent summit, and we have uh, folks from all over the country, about 300 folks from all over the country coming together. Um, it started off around handgun violence, and obviously it's expanded now with so many things that have happened to domestic violence, to just the violence that we experienced here in Massachusetts or in the marathon. Uh, you know, just all kinds of violence, uh, by issues around violence in our communities and how we can you know, grapple with it and get a hand on it. And we've had uh, elected folks and faith-based folks, and I want to thank, you know, on the air, uh, the minister of the AME uh, Baptist Church, Metropolitan Baptist Church in uh, D.C. Uh, he has been just uh, great in letting us use this church for this event. And it has grown so big that we've had to split it into two events, mm. and we're having a separate youth event now because their agenda got so big that we didn't want it to be drowned out by the adult agenda. So we're having a youth uh, summit from 9 to 12, and then the, the summit that we plan from 1 to 5. This. And I also wanted to thank, as well as Reverend uh, Ron Braxton, the senior pastor of that church, I want to thank City Councilman Charles Gancy and uh, Tito Jackson, who both have um, given us proclamations from the city of Boston proclaiming on this 22nd a day of nonviolence in our communities yes. and the day of reflection starting off that weekend with the march on washington and going right to the pulpit on sunday we're trying we have over 300 ministers around the country who will be preaching from their pulpits <laughs> on sunday about the community coming together about some conflict resolution especially for our young people mm -hmm. Faye, and, what um, uh, yes what are some of the issues that the young people have presented that resulted resulted in you opening a, a, a separate agenda um, for them? It was an issue that they presented. It was how quickly the event grew. And we were mm -hmm. very uh, cognizant because we are aiming this at you. We have put together a kit, um, including a video about conflict resolution within our youth community, something that I wrote that was produced by uh, Harvestside Productions in Washington, D.C that we didn't want that to run out of time, making sure that we were uh, giving the audience that we are aiming at the proper amount of time to be heard. And so that's why we separated the two agendas. It doesn't mean that there won't be any adults at the use of saying that, that, that defeats the purpose. That's what we want. Or vice versa. It means that they will have a panel of their own and will be able to guide that conversation in the direction that they feel we need to hear. And it's just as much about us listening as us trying to assist them in those in, those, uh, in that agenda of violence in the community. We have a great guy uh, named uh, Randall Benjamin, who is an executive director of an organization called Safe Roots to School, and he will be putting on a great presentation about how they have done some pilot programs, especially in the city of Detroit, which we know is having such a hard time, about establishing safe routes so children can get to school and not have to walk by dead bodies and drug dealers and just dilapidated situations. Hmm. So this is happening the 22nd. That's going to be in D.C., right? Well, in Washington, D.C., right. at the AME uh, Metro Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. AME Metro yeah. Baptist Church. Okay. And that... so at this point, um, we're also going to be uh, live streaming and broadcasting. As I said, it's growing so big that we uh, are outgrowing our venue. And so there are some folks around the country that want to plug into what we're doing. And so we will be broadcasting, I believe, out to Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland at this point. Mm -hmm. Are there any buses? Are you encouraging anyone from Boston to attend? I have encouraged plenty of people from Boston to attend and reached out to them. And I know that there's a conflict because I believe the bus leaving from Boston going down for the march doesn't leave until Friday morning. But I do know that there are a couple of carloads of folks that are going to come down. And we still have some hope that, uh, that either one of the counselors will have some time in their schedule to come down and present the proclamations themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they, they will be uh, standing beside you know, the uh, mayor of D.C., um, the county council of uh, Maryland, uh, the Virginia delegate legislature, and a couple of uh, councils in Pennsylvania, I believe uh, the state senate in Colorado. So that I think we have a city 
information that they have, people they can go to, that there are other ways of resolving conflict, and that, you know, they don't have to be a victim of what they witness. Faye Morris is our special guest here on the morning show on Touch 106.1 FM. You can chime into the conversation 617-445-1061. Faye is a special consultant to the program who always brings us these huge, these huge stories and, uh, and, and, and contributions to the program that is so very much needed. Faye, um, you're a grandmother. And you have two very, very three. young grandchildren. Three now, that's right. You got three. And as you look at them, and you will try to explain to them as they are growing up what all this was about. What are you going to tell them? Well, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to be honest because I have to tell you, when I started as an activist, you know, many, many years ago when my own children were the age of my granddaughters, um, I thought when they were the age they are now that, you know, maybe my struggles would be something I could put down. It is amazing that now I'm looking into the eyes of my granddaughters and continuing for that reason. And I will tell them that the change is not ever easy. You can't plot it out and plan it. You just have to be part of it until you can't do that anymore. You don't, there is no point where you get to say, you know what, I can, I've, I've done my bit. I'm not doing it anymore. There's no such thing. As long as there are things that need to be done, then this society is just as much your responsibility as anyone else. And you need to take part in it. Faye Morrison, anything else on our, on our calendar we need to know? Because I plan you know, on... That, you know, the only other thing is I continue, to, I hope you will continue to say to your audience that here's a Congress that recessed the last Friday, yep. 2nd of August, yep. taking their 40th vote on a, on a affordable care act that they know they can't overturn while they did nothing to fix the issue about voting rights. And as we speak, more states are adding layer upon layer of, of ways to keep poor and minorities from voting. And another law went into effect yesterday. So as we speak, the clock continues to tick. Our rights continue to be shipped away at, and you know once you give those away, it is hard to get back where we were. And I would hate to think that we were only going to fight to be back where we were. If we're going to do something, we need to do something that comes together and propels us forward and so that we're not here ever again. Amen. Let's keep moving it forward. Thank you so much, Faye Morrison. God bless. Please stay safe. Have a good day. All righty. I'll talk to you soon. And we turn from Faye Morrison on the international and national scene to our own international and young national star one, Jamal Crawford. Uh, Jamal. Oh, excuse me. I'm a Jamal. I have to call you just Jamal now. Uh, right. Jamal. One name uh, only. One name only. Now, you like the name or you, when you hear the name, you uh, absolutely identify with the person. And there's two sides of, well, there's two, there's the, the people that like them. And the people that don't. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he knows this. Oh, your mic ain't on? Talk. Just yes. Yeah, I know the mic is on. I know the mic is on. So, um, no, you were praying the mic was on. Did uh, I press the right button? No, this I This new know, board. No, I, have, right I have it. I think I have it. <laughs> okay, you're under control. You got it. So, Jamal, uh, who likes you? Uh, you know, it's funny because with this reputation that I have, uh, uh, you know, one, I would say to the people who don't like me, Y'all should team up. You might have a better chance of uh, doing something. Because individually, you got no hopes. Um, and for the people that like me out there, I mean, you know, I was walking through Roxbury yesterday, you know, promoting for the uh, for the Rally for Solutions that we did. And, uh, you know, with uh, my brother, Royal, uh, shout out to Royal, came out there with me, and a young lady named Petrina. And I was telling them, I was like, you know, so watch this, because, you know, people have had questions about, you know, what really is the reach? I, I literally can't walk. 10 feet in Roxbury without, you know, yo, Jamal, you know, for older brother, or elder sister, young man on the street, you know, like kids, it, it, you know, so uh, I, when I walk out in my community, I, I feel loved. Uh, those who don't like me are oftentimes, you know, uh, the people in those positions of, of authority that, that I often have to critique. And, uh, and, and, and some people like, you know, Harriet Tubman, uh, sometimes you have to drag people to freedom. So what is it that you think they don't like about you? Um, you know, I really don't know because I, I strive to be fair. You know, I haven't uh, stolen any money. I haven't, uh, you know, tried to holler at nobody's woman. Uh, you know, I haven't messed with no kids. Um, so as far as, you know, I do. And I you haven't paddled any drugs. Right. You haven't done it. Excuse right. me. Not me, recently. Let me, let me ask a question. <laughs> let me ask a question. Why is that so important? Because black people at times, we get into this whole thing about, do they like me? Don't they like I don't care what the people don't like me. Well, That's the big difference with me. 
part of part of my spiritual beliefs is really a great deal of introspection. So, uh, and because I'm very critical of others, I mm -hmm. always strive to make sure that I apply the same lens to others that I do to myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generally uh, every night before I go to bed, you know, uh, sometimes in that quiet time when you might have your eyes closed but you ain't sleep yet, I use that time to reflect and focus on the things that I did during the day. And uh, one thing I can say about myself is oftentimes I might speak to someone in a very harsh manner that later I think, mm, I could have said that in a, in a you know, in a, in a more uh, diplomatic uh, way or what have you. Uh, generally, what I said was the truth, but the way that I conveyed it, I could have been a little bit more uh, uh, caring and gentle with it. Uh, so things like that, I notice about myself. Uh, but other than that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the person that I am and, and the work that I do and uh, give thanks. You know, I, I, I don't do it for the approval of others, you know, so it. it well, try, well try, to, try, try to keep these thoughts in your mind. Uh, there's a poem by Theodore Roosevelt called The Man in the Middle. Mm. The person in the middle, the person in the center of the ring. Read it, and then you'll get a true gauge of what life is. Or read If by Rudyard Kipling. Mm. Read those type of things, and I'll get you copies if you need them, partner, because I'm pretty sure you probably read them. But if you haven't, you need to read those two poems because it is a lonely path that you're walking right now. A lot of people are going to be praising you, patting you on the back. Oh, Jamal, we love you. Da, 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 da. Remember, uh, Friends of Distinction wrote the song, Smiling Faces, because I said it was the OJs. Friends of Distinction, the OJs wrote Backstabbers. Mm. So there are two songs that I play a lot, and I look at everyone that I come in contact with, Jamal, with a skeptical eye. Until you prove yourself to me, because I've already proven myself to you, I'm going to be the warrior that's going to fight for you and say things that you don't have the courage to say, particularly to perceive the power that we talk about all the time. But I want to switch this to what happened yesterday, because on that plaza, there are over 100 people. You only asked for 100. That's right. And it had to make you feel good in regards to, yeah, they did it. We listen, Sister Zakia, the sister, uh, the, uh, Reverend Collier, and a bunch of other people that I know, Sali, and a bunch of people. And many of them I was introducing myself to. I've never seen any of these people before. I met the guy you talked about, uh, Greg Walton. Greg Walton, who's going to be a guest later on in right. the program this morning. He's a computer expert, and I told him, look, you two need to get together because this young brother has such knowledge that he'll be able to help you with Blackstonian. He was instantly there, correct? That's right. He instantly said, Jamal, whatever you're going to need, tell me, because I want to help. So... You bringing a lot. You brought a, a a blend of people there yesterday. I saw many white faces. I saw many Hispanic faces. I saw a few Asian people there. Where you're trying to bring this whole thing together. And what did you feel at the end of it? Well, uh, I felt number one. I, I, I felt hopeful because see, oftentimes we're, we're conducting a social experiment, if you will. You put the call out there, you really don't know how people are going to respond. Uh, people could have showed up with bags of rotten tomatoes and eggs, for, for all you know. Uh, so uh, it, it made me hopeful that, once again, here's another example of us doing something. You know, we don't have a budget. We don't have an office. Uh, you know, nothing. You saw uh, many of the, the people there who are the ones that I really organize with are young men, you know, in their early 20s who've been around me since they've been around 17. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and, and this is our little, you know, motley crew uh, of people. So, you know, it, it, it made me hopeful that people uh, do give a darn. Uh, and we're willing to come out there in the middle of the concrete jungle that is City Hall Plaza, uh, you know, and, and talk about solutions. We stayed pretty much on message in terms of, you know, delivering real solutions and ideas of how to handle this violence. Uh, you know, and then going into the, the mayor's office and we got all the video. It's taking me longer to put together that I should have that out today. But uh, and then looking at the video, that was the thing, because obviously when you're there, you're only seeing out your own eyeballs. Yep. But now being able to see it through the camera and really get a scope of, you know, the crowd and us walking up the steps to City Hall and through the door and watching all those people go through the metal detector and all up to the up to the mayor's office. I think, you know, it was uh, it, it was very powerful. You know, what are you trying to do? Well, with this, the request was, okay, simply first, we've identified the solutions, right? Mm -hmm. Or well, our ideas for some, some solutions, mm -hmm. not all the solutions. And they're all going to be put together, too. Exactly. Right. We, we started compiling last night from the video. Mm -hmm. we, got, we got all that. Um, and then we deliver to the mayor's person, right, uh, our issues and our ideas, our solutions. And then we demanded a meeting uh, with the mayor and demanded. the Boston police, police commissioner, uh, Davis, 
uh, where I've been trying to put this meeting together for about five years. Five years, and uh, they've avoided it. So now this is, you know, it's it's on it's on their table, and they now have to uh, deal with it. So Jamal, as as I think about um, you know some of the things that you're here to discuss, I have um, a question that I want you to think about and and then answer when we come back from the break. Is the black community in total isolation from the the issue of violence and providing the solutions that are necessary to eradicating them? Six one seven. 445-1061, The Fabric of the Black Community, in studio, Jamal Crawford, Blackstonian at blackstonian.com, his telephone number. 617-297-7721, that's 617-297-7721. Smiling faces, smiling faces, tell lies, and I got proof. Okay, now we got. All right, now. Okay, there you have it. We are Jimmy. Come on, Jimmy got pipes, right? Come on now. We're back. Jimmy got pipes. We're back on the morning show with Jamal Crawford, our own Jamal Crawford from Blackstonian Magazine (laughs) here on 106.1 FM. Jimmy, we'll see you at the New England Urban Music Awards on stage. I could do that if I yes, had to. Yes, yes, yes. I've done this for a living. Okay. But, uh, but back to you, young man, because, you know, more than anything, it's, 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 it does my heart good as an older person to see a young person like you step out there on faith and on courage. When we walked into the mayor's office, that's when it all, because I can't wait for that. I'm, I'm going to Blackstone to see that video. Yes, sir. And if you remember... And everybody was getting, people were irritated because they had to get through the metal detector. Man, come up five flights of stairs. Right. And you said, everybody and then the young lady made down. a little that smart remark right. she made as well, right? Yeah. What's yes. the smart remark? You can't be doing that, Jamal. Uh, you know, I, I'd I be- like to know. I believe when all these people, she was she was first of all flustered. Right. I'm, I'm certain that, you know. Now, she uh, being a staff uh, She was an aide. I don't want to mention aid. her, her, okay. her name. Uh, one she of, was the mayor's aide. First right. thing, well, they all, I, Certainly they there was, are. I don't think that she's seen that many black people, <laughs> Latino people, you know, all the people who were there. In I'm just uh, about mayor's, positive she had mayor's uh, little, you know, sitting room outside okay. of the, the waiting room outside of the office, uh, you know, in quite some time. It has happened before because I've mm-hmm. seen it before, you know, um, but, you know, in quite some time. And so it was like, whoa, you know, uh, she was taking it back. And then she was like, OK, you know, as we were you know, talking, we want the mayor to get this message, make sure the mayor gets this message. Well, he'll be happy to know that he has so many fans. Whoa! That almost that caused a riot. Yeah. People said, "No, no, no, we're not fans." And then you all had to say, "Listen, please calm down. That's not the message, young lady." And you heard these people because they were raising their voice. And he said, "Everybody, please remember, we're going to keep a modicum of decorum here. Right. That's the most important thing." And then you turned back to her, and so they said. It's not that kind of meeting. Right, exactly. <laughs> she said that I almost fell over. Exactly. You said it's not that kind of meeting. Go ahead, Jamal. Before the break, though, I asked you, mm-hmm. do you feel like the black community is isolated in regard to providing solutions to the city? I, I, I singled out violence and prevention of some of the crazy incidents, but... What about in economic development, uh, cre- job creation, uh providing quality health care and, and access to youth programs. See, now, this is a very, uh, uh, you know, deep can of worms, let's say, because... I see, opened them. Right. When we talk about, you know, the devaluation of black and brown life, which is what this whole thing about, the counting of the shootings, you know, the comparison to the marathon, the comparison to Amy Lord. So if our lives are devalued, right, if, if someone doesn't value your life, you know, fair to say, they probably don't value your opinion either, right? Or your input, right? So I don't think that this is new. Uh, You know, as a young man here, I became active in my teens. Uh, There were people at those times that had offered solutions. I remember uh, uh, Deborah Prothrow Stith um, had had created uh, the anti-violence curriculum. (laughs) Okay, so, so that was an answer then. I don't know where it is now, if it's been updated, expanded. I know it's not in the schools. That is for I certain. I think that was like in 2004. What? Uh, no. No, 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 no. I was a teenager. No, that was oh, way okay. before that. I was a yeah. teenager. Well, yeah, that was in come up again. Come up again, right. No, it, did, it came up again in 2004, but that that is, uh, 
I want to say the 1992, three. I would have been more than that. I, I think it might have been the 80s. It might have been the late 80s. I think it was in the late 80s. I was still a teenager. Yeah, I think it was the late 80s. I, yeah. I, I think it was late 80s, Jamal. I think you're right. So, so my point is that we've had solutions forever. You and I met working for Senator Bill Owens uh, with the National Black Agenda Convention in 2004. That wasn't nothing but compiling solutions and compiling solutions and now serves as the inspiration behind the Boston Black Agenda uh, for a localized effort like that. So we've been providing solutions for a long time. Community meetings after community meetings, the mayor's been at, uh, BPD commissioner has been at, people have offered feedback, Mamlio has given feedback and some viable solutions uh, you know, so on and so on. So that's not the issue is that, oh, well, our community is not given any, you know, solutions or input. No, that's not that's not uh, the problem. The problem is we're not listened to. We're not respected. Right. Even though we are citizens, voters and whether you vote or not, because see, some people be like, well, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Nah, -uh, let's no. change that criteria. That. Uh, you pay taxes. That's the one. If you pay taxes, you got the right to complain. Okay. And that was the first thing you brought up exactly. on your agenda yesterday. Exactly. You said, listen, you, just because you don't vote, right. you pay taxes. And exactly. everybody would be like, yeah, 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 exactly. wow, yeah, yeah, you're right. So that is the qualifier. You're a citizen, you're a taxpayer, and if you choose to exercise your uh, uh, right to vote. Mm -hmm. what Question. Gives, Go ahead. Go. What gives anyone the right to ignore a constituency or a constituent base? Well, okay. They don't, they don't have that right. I mean, anyone can, you know, do what they want to do. And actually, you know, the second part of this conversation, I got to tell you all a doozy of a story. What happened last night at Flames and Grove Hall mm -hmm. for the mayoral forum with Dan Conley, uh, Suffolk County DA Dan Conley. Uh, well, Wait a minute, why are you fixing your mouth like Cause, that? Because, I, I mean, Say I, I was I was livid say. last night, okay. livid. I went home livid. Hopefully Cornell Mills is on the, uh, is out there in the listening audience and will call in. Uh, so please, if we get a call from Cornell, please make sure that goes through. But we'll, we'll get in that story. But they do not have that right. When, when they chose to be a public servant, let's, let's just do a word That's examination. It. Public servant. Guess mm -hmm. what? We's the public. So you actually serve us now some of them, you exactly and some of them forget that mm -hmm. and with these these positions they get arrogant oh, they yeah. get haughty and they demand respect from you like 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 somehow uh, we're, we're back in medieval times and it's and it's a, and it's a king you know and that is not the way that uh that the government is set up and one thing you know too in the bible i need to look that verse up because i use it so often and i don't have it maybe some of the listening audience may know but there's a part in the bible where god says i am no respecter of persons Right. Which means your authority, your little office that you have really means nothing. Nothing. OK. And so so people like the mayor, people like the police commissioner, people like uh, city councilors, elected officials, people like uh, D.A. Dan Conley need to understand that we, the taxpayers, the citizens, the voters, it is we that they are supposed to serve. And if we have a tough question, guess what? That's part of the job. And, you know, look. Don't become a football player if you can't take a hit. It just, it just doesn't make sense. You, if you're on the field playing football, you've got to expect that at some time in your career, Somebody you're going to get a hit. All right, look, even sometimes the refs get hit. <laughs> All right? And, All right? and they ain't even playing. And, not, and yeah. they don't got pads coaches, or nothing. <laughs> coaches get run over on the sideline. Right. If you're in that, in, that, in, in that corridor, something's going to happen. Right. But see, you're a young man and you're seeing this, and I can't wait for this doozy of the story. But the bottom line is this. For too long, it's I've been one of those few people or lonely voices that have called these people to power, perceived power. And I've always asked them, have you, you're not anointed. You are appointed. Right. And what part of this don't you understand? I don't care if you're a five-time mayor. I don't care how powerful you think you are. And this is where I lean to my spiritual part. Like you said, everybody doesn't have to deal with religion. But we are spiritual. I go in my spirit and I say, God, touch these people. Make them try to understand. Because apparently they're not getting it. Because as you mentioned, if you're looking at this scenario and you, I'm asking you for your vote, how dare me turn around once I get your vote and tell you, okay, now I've been here two terms, I've been here three terms, because that happens in Washington too. We're not just talking about here, we're talking about what congressmen, senators, and so forth. When they don't listen, Jamal, then you you are compelled to do what you did yesterday. 
This is what I'm trying to tell people. That it's the old expression. Bobby Seale told me this many years ago. Those who make nonviolent revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. If we had marched in that office yesterday with guns, I bet you every news division in this city would have been there in a less than 10 minutes. You would have had satellite trucks, beams going up, everything, right? We came there peacefully. So as we were leaving, I said not to take anything away from this young man. Please inform the mayor. I think her name is O'Brien. I think it's Liz O'Brien was the purpose of man. Please inform the mayor if he does not answer this demand. And I'm glad you said demand. You didn't say request. This demand. The next time we will come, we will come in greater numbers. And we plan to occupy this office. So, bingo. Now it's on him. And I'm waiting to hear how fast he's going to respond. Go ahead, Jamal. Yeah, well, you know, um... Once we, we send in the thing, I was going to send it in last night, but it, uh, it took a little bit longer compiling, you know, the other uh, other input we received. So uh, when I get off of the air, I'm going to go home and, and, and finish that and the video uh, and send off that off. And, and let's just see uh, how long it takes. You know, uh, I, I would expect that today being Tuesday that, you know, uh, we should be able to get a, a response, you know, by the end of the week, or certain within this week. And you will come here and let us know immediately oh, yes. what that response is, correct? Certainly. Right? Certainly. 617-445-1061. As we have matured, Jamal, people oftentimes either uh, have, have, who have helped raise us or taught us some things, um, monitor our successes and then also critique some of our failures and uh, we do have a caller who knows you. Are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am so excited to be on touch and, you know, to welcome all of you because I listen to you every morning and you give me such inspiration. And when I found out that Jamal Crawford was on, who is my former student, and I am so proud of him. <laughs> Oh he Jesus! Junior, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it had it had it had it had to be tenth, ninth, and tenth grade because I got kicked out and I got kicked out in the first uh, month of eleventh grade and got my GED. <laughs> Please, when you, will you please hold on to the line? Because I may have a project for you since you're an independent filmmaker. Uh, could you please give your information to our own Lady Karma as soon as you leave the airway? And we thank you for your call. Thank you. Lady Karma, if you could get that. Thank you, you know, so much. If I, if I could say a little something, too. You know, uh, thank you, Ms. Sharif. That, that was very uh, uh, kind of you. It reminds me of that old TV show, This Was Your Life. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But you know, it's funny because as I mentioned, you know, um, the reason I ended up at Umana was because I had got kicked out of every private school that my mother sent me to, and it became that the BPS was the only place that would take me. Subsequently, got kicked out of there. I was thrust into an environment in the Mario Umana Harvard School of Science and Technology in East Boston, thrust into a situation which one of the most wicked racist regimes I've ever been under. And I mentioned a couple names. Anybody who went to Umana will remember. See, we when I got there, we had a black principal named Mr. Gus Anglin. And they, they hated him and they chased him out. I know and they, and they hated him because he liked the kids. Mm -hmm. And the kids liked him. So that mm -hmm. means, oh, Ick's name I on that. I remember Gus. Yeah. All right. So he had respect to the kids. He was a good guy. Try to work with you and, you know, give you kind of like a fatherly uncle kind of vibe. Okay. So they got him out of there. They brought in a uh, law and order guy, uh, Mr. Arangio. And Mr. Arangio was on. Arangio. Yes. Arangio. <laughs> so Mr. Uh, Mr. Arangio became the principal. Uh, uh, Mr. Sacchetti was the house master or whatever. But it was just a racist regime, one in which the white students use nigger. They rarely used it twice. But <laughs> the white students would use nigger. The te uh -huh. teachers. Say the N -word. Oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Uh, you know, Sister the, Virginia. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, ho hopefully, give thanks in this context. You know, it's a descriptor and not a, you know, we're not Absolutely. using it as a colloquialism. But in any event um, um so once again the, the 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 teachers and the staff also used the n-word uh, mm -hmm. including the school police security guards at the time which were very vicious so what miss sharif represented was an oasis within that school of somebody who actually cared about you right and so that's why we um we we gravitated towards her and she she was played that role for so many kids because she was one of the few teachers that really cared which I believe if we spearhead ourselves into the classroom today, a lot of the conversation that we have, and we say things, some things is just in context, but other things really have a meaning. We need to have someone who understands us leading students toward their education. And do we have enough of that experience that you and other students were able to share with Ms. Sharif? I think, I think it's rare. I mean, cases like that are exceptional. You know, we see each other, we've maintained a, a great relationship over the years. I know her family, so on. Uh, and funny story too, the, the, that crew of young men uh, needs to be said were Diane Wilkerson's nephews who I went to school with, mm -hmm. which was uh, Jermaine and my good friend uh, Andre Thomas, mm -hmm. right? And so me and Andre were the, uh, were the rappers. Uh, uh, Jermaine came with the spoken word piece, right? And, uh, and I can't and, wait to see this. Oh, do man, you it, remember the rap? Oh, this is an update bringing you up to times. I do it with rhymes, so let me recite mine. That's all. You, that's all I got so far. <laughs> all right, that's, that's all. I, you know, that's right. I I expect the disc. <laughs> I want the disc. I can put that in my in my famous disc library. Oh yes, indeed. Because I because I have some famous stuff. And you're going in there. And you can see you can see a famous Roxbury sister, uh, Shalu, who tried to teach us to dance. Bless her heart. And I had jacked up every single one of them moves she taught us, boy. <laughs> right. You know, it's funny. Uh, everyone knows you as Jamal, right? And you, you have a number of different um, areas that you play in. You use your artistic creativity, and that name is... Uno the Prophet. Your writing uh, is... I use Jamal Crawford for my poetry. Well, who is Nat... Turner. Oh, Nat Turner. Uh, Uno the Prophet, a.k.a. Hey, Nat, Nat Turner, Turner, Devil Burner. Because uh, Nat was an answer in hip-hop where everybody was, yo, I'm, I'm Tony Maserati, I'm John Gotti, I'm, you know, Al Capone and all this type of stuff. Everybody was taking names and wanted to be other, you know, something else. So, uh -huh. you know, uh, I took names like Akhenaten is another one of my, my uh, a.k.a.s. And Nat Turner, I wanted to take something that was reflective of our history and our culture and, you know, feelers... Uh, you know, uh, people. I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't going to call myself AKA Clarence Thomas. You know what I mean? So I needed, <laughs> I needed something strong. You know what I mean? Is there anything about your artistic creativity that allows you to continue with the movement of the organizing and activism that you're engaged in? What keeps you going? Like, so, you know, I can imagine you sitting downstairs in the basement that I've been in. You know, and Jamal has about eight to ten computers, I think. I don't know. He may have increased that number. And I just see you just just doing work. But what do you do with 
what's inside of you that you want to express artistically. And do you have anything you want to share with our listeners? Well, an uh, excellent example is, uh, you know, a as you had on the other day, my good brother, Jasiri X. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the true sense of, you know, uh, what we talk about, guerrilla warfare, using everything around you, all everything, uh, the means at your disposal uh, to accomplish a goal and to further, you know, uh, expand consciousness and, and further the movement. So hip hop to me is a tool. It's a tool that I pick up and use uh, for a purpose. The same thing with the poetry, right? And it is actually a complement to the organizing because, for instance, that's why I have a rapport with the youth that I do. Oh, I've, one, two, I've, one, two. I've challenged youth to before to be like, you know, youth in hip hop, mm -hmm. yo, battle me. <laughs> battle me can you beat the old man right and so we we have that type of relationship because now they see a guy you know 42 still looks relatively young but got some gray hairs and whatnot but still got some swag about him right can still rhyme can still go to the open mic poetry set and burn it down so you know that that builds a rapport and then being able to use that type of uh, uh creativity to further the movement so in terms of what i would share with you everybody you know go to youtube.com slash jamal c j a m a a R H L C J A M A R H L C YouTube.com slash Jamal C and go check out some of my videos. Remade some very popular songs like uh, Little Wayne's and Millie this years ago when oh, it was when it was hot. Remade uh, a Millie and instead of talking about a million pills and a million guns and a million women and a million cars, I talk about a million Africans, right? What happened to the indigenous people of America? A million Indians. Right. And I talk about the, the, the genocide that was perpetrated on us uh, uh, by, by uh, our, our not so civil friends. <laughs> not so civil. Six one seven four four five one zero six one. The fabric of the black community. If you are just tuning in, you must recognize the voice. It is that of Jamal uh, Nat Turner, a.k.a. What's the burner? Devil burner. Devil, devil burner. Oh, Gotta okay. burn the devils. Gotta burn the devil. And Jimmy Myers, the telephone number here is 617-445-1061. He's going to go into a freestyle right now. You going to go into it? <laughs> if I give you a topic, you can do it. <laughs> it's early in the morning, girl. Okay. All right. I'll Jamal, leave you Jamal, think of this, though, as you mentioned. Um, I, I can't wait to hear your story about Dan Conley last evening because... I have had my issues with this man over the years. But see, the difference was I battled him on 50,000 watch stations. I battled him in front of the country and the world. And the bottom line is he, our attorney general, uh, these are people that I consequently had lost respect for. And this was years ago. And I told him as such. I said, let me ask you a question. How can you think of wanting to be a senator with your track record as an attorney general? How can you think of wanting to be the mayor with your track record as a district attorney? And see, many of these people don't understand. So many of us are very smart, Jamal. We can read. See, I read deep into the night. I was up at 4.30 this morning dealing with just one situation that most people have not a clue about. And then I'm dealing with a second situation, Alex Rodriguez. I'm just going to run this by very quickly. All these people don't even realize, oh, Alex Rodriguez is being arrogant. He's this, he's that, he's this. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know anything about history? Because I had to tell some of my media colleagues this last night. I said, 1994, there was a baseball strike. It destroyed baseball. 1995, fans were down, fan support for the game was down 40%. They got a home run race that started to bring this back. Now, they knew, the owners knew that McGuire was juiced. They knew Sosa was juiced. They didn't care. So we spin from there through Barry Bonds, through, through all of these people who are, who are steroid people. Roger Clemens, who did his little thing and got away with it. Barry Bonds, who got nailed to a degree. But I'm looking at this and I'm laughing. Here's that duality of justice I tell you about. And I said, look, why am I the only sportscaster that knows the history of this? All you're talking about, Alex Rodriguez, Alex Rodriguez. Think of this. He's not doing anything that's not his constitutional right to do. He has the right to try to appeal a, bad, a decision that he doesn't like. And whether he's guilty or not. Think of this. These are the same people, Alan Bud Selig, who was in baseball at that time and knew these guys were doing steroids. They took a blind eye, Jamal. They just looked the other way because fans are sitting in the seats again. So now we consequently are at a stage where they want to police the game all of a sudden. 
it's so, and, and there is a dichotomy here. There is, there, is, there is a comparison here to be made. It's the same way with us. You don't want to talk. These people of perceived power don't want to speak to us all the way up to now. Now they want to talk to us. And I'm saying, oh, mayoral race, they have to talk to us. Now, your Dan Conley story. Well, we'll, we'll get to the Dan Conley story after we take a quick oh, we break. break. Mm -hmm. And uh, be, we have been joined by Senator Wilkerson's son, Cornell, who is, if not as uh, outspoken as Jamal, uh, more outspoken. Uh, and so they will share together their experiences of what happened at the Meet the Candidates over at Flames. Um, I believe last night was the last series uh, held by Greatest Minds. Chip Greenwich, shout out to you. 617-445-1061. We have a couple of calls coming in uh, during this break. We will bring Cornell in and, uh, you know, we'll find out what happened, what went down. What's crack a lacking? Jimmy. The J, the I, the M, the M, the Y, the J, the I. The oh, listen, you, you notice I'm silent. You, you notice I'm silent. Uh oh, and look, what, what, what's the idea? And you know, a caller called in and mentioned it. I want to bring this up. I want to announce right here, right now, our new organizing effort. And we are going to have a rally at Touch. We're going to have a rally to stop Sunshine from singing on the radio. <laughs> Go to break. <laughs> Where there is love, I'll be there. Nobody gonna stop me from singing. <laughs> Y'all don't know, I got pipes. I don't care what nobody says. Yeah, they're called, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're called broken and I rotten have, and leaking. No, no, <laughs> no, I have pipes. I will sing a song. Sing along. All right, well then. If I can't sing, okay, I and rusty well, bites. I might as well rap one, one, two, or one, two. My name is Sunshine. Oh, okay, I'm here we go. Studio. I'm not going, I won't go. I'm down with Jamal and Cornell, too. If you don't like what I'm doing, then you. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you want to do that. Now, now, let, act like I'm, I That was the eight bars. Is okay. that eight bars? No, sir. Go ahead, Carla, you're live. Yes, sir. Jamal. 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 Excuse me. Jamal. Uh, it was very insightful. You know, my first experience Anna? in Los City Hall was a uh, powerful movement. Anna? So I really uh, was forward to joining them and, and then traveling. You know, and uh, keep up the good work. So, Hold up, Joseph. Yes, Before you go, um, do you have your radio up or are you listening to the computer in the background? Well, actually, I just got up my car, so it should be better. Okay, that's great. Tell us what your experience was um, yesterday. Well, you know, I'm from Cambridge and I do a lot of political things. And I'm very, you know, active in my field. And so I've been traveling across the country. And I see the struggles even work there, you know, and I'll get more people. So tell me, how did you hear? That's that's really important to know. Yeah, how did you hear that something? Mm -hmm. Shout out to Brother Greg. All right. Well, thank you so much for calling in. We're going to go to the next caller, and then I believe they have a juicy story to tell us. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate you and stay in contact with Jamal and, Co and Cornell. Okay, so that caller couldn't wait. If you want to call back, please give us a call. 617-445-1061. Throughout the entire month or of July and going into August, uh, Greatest Minds held uh, forums right in flames supporting our own uh, black restaurants and 
small businesses and each week uh, on Monday evenings there were three candidates of 12 uh, who are running for mayor and the community was invited out to have conversations with these candidates. Last night was the last uh, session that was held by Greatest Minds and it just so happens Jamal decided to go as well as Cornell. Who were the other two mayoral candidates it, besides uh, 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 um, Conley? It was actually three because Dan Conley was supposed to show up last week and was unable to make it because of course he was dealing with Amy Lord's situation. Mm -hmm. So he was unable to make last week so Chip started an hour uh, earlier this week and, uh, and Dan Conley came on. The other people were Marty Walsh, uh, Bill Walzak, and uh, Charlotte Golar Ritchie. Um, and I did not stay for any of the other ones because after Dan Conley spoke, I literally was so angry I had to go home because, uh, I mean, I was just that angry. I had to go home and compose myself. 617-445-1061. We want to hear what you have to say, Jamal, about uh, uh, Dan Connolly and other candidates. However, uh, we actually had another interview scheduled. This call is coming from Oakland, California. I know all of the brothers in here, including myself, are going to be very pleased to learn that we have Uncle Bobby on hold. He is the uncle of Oscar Grant. And as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, Fruitvale Station, the movie is out. This is a befitting time. Trayvon Martin uh, around the Dream Defenders who are in Florida right now fighting um, to abolish stand your ground laws and to end, you know, the school to prison pipeline. And there is a movement uh, that Uncle Bobby and others are spearheading. So we want to just welcome him into the dialogue because in his own nephew's case, there was a district attorney involved, so uh, we want to welcome him, Jimmy Myers, Jamal, and Cornell. Uncle Bobby, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning to you. Good, Good morning, morning, sir. Good morning. It Sorry is... for your loss. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uncle Bobby, thank you for participating here on the morning show from over 3,000 miles away. Can you tell us what the experience uh, you've been going through has been like with seeking justice in your nephew's death? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, first, I hope all the listeners are familiar with Dr. Grant and what happened to him in Oakland on January 1st, 2009 uh, on that Oakland Park platform. As you know, the movie is titled Fruitvale Station. Yeah. That is where he was um, again murdered at. Um, well, I, I, I guess I can tell you our experience in the what I consider today is more of a racist criminal justice system mm -hmm. uh, was was uh, was really uh, traumatizing. Um, you know, we of course was able to have the first time in California state history an officer while on duty shooting a black and brown man um, charged, arrested, convicted, and sent to jail. Uh, of course that was no easy task. Many things happened here in the Bay Area uh, that helped that to occur. And so we have to always uh, as a family thank the community for standing with us, crying with us, for going back and forth to court with us for um, supporting us and for um, utilizing their First Amendment right to speak to that injustice that they witnessed on their Fruitville Park platform. Mm -hmm. but had it not been for the video of the community, the commuters that was on that train that night, none of us today would know who Oscar Grant is because we are very clear as a family and know that there are many Oscar Grants that happen all across the United States. And of course, many of them do not have video, so there are unnamed individuals that are killed in our community uh, exactly like us. So we were just blessed and fortunate to have commuters that um, saw wrong happening pull out their cameras and videotape. It was those videotapes that was used in the court proceedings. 
proceeding that um, transpired after his arrest. And of course, in that courtroom, uh, we had to deal with the district attorney. I uh, hope that he would, uh, you know, perform his best in getting this officer charged for the murder he committed of our nephew. Uh, also, we had to deal with the judge, of course, that we knew had a history of being, and not only as the judge, but also just district attorney himself and always set on cases that pertain to police officers and always gave favorable ruling to the police officers despite the evidence that may have been presented within the court proceedings. And of course, uh, we had a jury, uh, Mike Trayvon, that was all white. And, you know, with that combination, you know, you can't help but to really get beat up by the system and hope just to get some kind of form of, of some justice, which in reality is really, really, really ever found in the way the system is designed today. So uh, the travesty I can share on uh, some points uh, in the courtroom that occurred, and that is our very first day, the judge, Judge Robert Perry, told us that if we do not make the crowd go away, the people that were supporting us mm -hmm. that spoke to the very issue of the uh, police killing of Oscar Grant, that if he did not make them go away, he would make this court proceeding last five to ten years until they all go away. This is a so judge telling you this, court. right? This That's our very first day in court. He told us that. And <laughs> of course, um, besides just the court in itself, he um, basically wore a white sheet in that courtroom because it was because of him that Johannes Mosley only got 11 months. The jury did come back with a guilty verdict on the gun enhancement. In the state of California, I'm not sure in Boston, but in the state of California, uh, a, a verdict of guilty on the gun enhancement is an automatic 10 years plus. So we knew we had at least a prison term for this officer who killed our nephew. Uh, the jury also came back with an involuntary manslaughter charge, which is uh, on the low term of two years, I'm sentenced to a max of four years. So we knew at the minimum he was going to do at least 12 years in prison. But this same judge, Judge Robert Perry, uh, claimed he had error in his instructions to the jury and took the gun enhancement off the table and sentenced Joe Pettis Mesley to two years sentence with double time served or gave him credit double times for each day served while he was in prison while going back and forth, well not prison but jail, while going back and forth to court for his hearing, which reduced his time down to 11 months. Mm. And to add salt to the wound, he also put him on the non-applicable parole, which is a piece of legislation that was, had came into existence in 2010 on January 21st, I believe, if I remember correctly. And that piece of legislation says that any felon um, that is convicted that has no issues while locked up is entitled to be placed on non-revocable parole by the judge's discretion. And what that is is that uh, these particular felons have to meet certain criteria. And once they are released from jail or prison and they have no encounter with the police for one year, that felony on their record automatically drops off. And if they are a police officer or uh, some other type of person, they really become what you call a regular citizen again. In other words, Johannes Murphy uh, was given back his gun and the right to reapply at the same uh, police station where he was fired from for the murder of my nephew, in which he did. Of course, we protest and Bart saw that this was great such a, um, a, a, a public relations chaos that they did not bring him back. But he is in Southern California to this day, right now, with a gun inside, working for some police agency doing what we hear is the form of security work. And of course, the first person I think of when I've heard that was George Zimmerman, mm -hmm. who was neighborhood watch. Mm -hmm. But we have another summit, uh, one who committed murder, with a gun inside, walking in our community, patrolling our streets, again, with the opportunity to kill. And this is the travesty of this system. And how we, not just we as a family, but we as a community, must address. You know, the support of Trayvon Martin is real critical at this time. Because we know all across the United States, according to the Malcolm X Grassroots Report, that just last year, 585, um, Men were killed. Out of that, three 
1061 if you just tuned in our family from the west side in o Oakland California Uncle Bobby is calling in discussing uh, the case surrounding his nephew Oscar Grant's death why should we care in Boston about Trayvon about uh, Oscar Grant and the, the work that it takes to uh, insert ourselves in these situations where we become the advocates and activists uh, around uh, criminal injustice. Well, I would say, um, you know, I'm familiar with the case there that was pretty, pretty big, D.J. Henry. Um, after death and what happened to him is much, just, much bigger than he is. It's happening all across the country as we see and as we watch the news. And it's happening at an unprecedented rate. Um, the reason why we should care is because it could be your child tomorrow. You know, and, and until we stand up, until we begin to really address this very issue, uh, we're just going to see more and more young black men being killed, uh, I mean, exponentially across the United States. And at some point, uh, we need to react before it's too late. And, and to react is right now. You know, what happened to Trayvon Martin was, a, again, a travesty to not just the system, but to us as a people. I mean, a total um, disrespect. And if we fail to support that family on a national level that was just expressed to us uh, through media all across the United States and all around the world to see just how heinous and racist the system could be, um, what's coming to us is going to be a, a very sad day as far as the black people in this community. I heard you say, um, I, I could hear it in your voice, Bob, when you said uh, you, you're more or less moving towards something that I talk about constantly, where people are going to have enough and then bad things are going to happen. This is one of the things that Jimmy Meyer said the day of the Zimmerman decision. And all since that time, you are going to have a backlash something's going to happen and then all of a sudden America will raise up on its haunches and say oh you know we don't want to hear this and, and, and these black people are out of control so what's so forth. but let's go back to your situation to a degree you mentioned to us you told us about the whole scenario in the courtroom from the first day you walked in there to the day you walked out you tell us that this man is walking around the street Janice Mesley today probably with a gun being able to do what he feels he wants to do the depiction in the movie. I have a couple of very quick questions. Your family's impressions of the movie. Did you have you seen it? Yes, uh, of course we've seen it. I've personally seen it probably about six times because of all the premieres. Of course, at the Sundance Film Festival, LA Film Festival, um, in New York, um, of course, um, in Oakland. I'm also in Arizona. Uh, you know, so I've seen it uh, many a time. Uh, I have to say, we have to take our head off, you know, family, we thank Forrest Whitaker for uh, producing, uh, you know, this movie, for mm -hmm. giving us a, a family the opportunity to uncriminalize, undemonize, and humanize Oscar. Uh, it was our hope through Ryan Krugler's vision that we can share Oscar to the world where all our young men can be seen in him. Mm -hmm. But having an Oscar is bigger than just Oscar. And there is an Oscar every day, as we know, dying at the hands of these type of um, state-sponsored terrorists. So we as a family thank Ford Whitaker for producing, Ryan Krugler for the vision and directing, of course, Michael B. Jordan for internalizing Oscar spirit, Octavia Spencer, Melody Diaz, and all the cast for their expression in this serious subject matter. Of course, um, their tears, their prayers, and their commitment we saw on the set. Ryan spent time with us and our family in our home so that he can really come to know Oscar. Mm -hmm. But then when he selected Michael B, that Michael B also would have the subject matter of who Oscar was really internalized to play a real character in his role. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, we are extremely happy and grateful to them for allowing us to have a place to share with the world of Oscar Grant. If you're just joining us, this is the morning show here on Touch 106.1 FM. I am Jimmy Myers along with Sunshine and our two in studio guests, Cornell and Jamal. And we're speaking with Uncle Bob. That's what he goes by. He is the uncle of Oscar Grant, the victim in the famous uh, Fruitvale Station shooting mm. and murder of young Oscar Grant. Um, very quickly, um, the proceeds from the film. Does your family receive any of this, and was there a civil suit against this police officer? Because to me, that's the way that you have to go. You have to fight the law with the law. Did you sue uh, um, the officer civilly, and how? what type of, of remuneration does your family receive from this terrible tra tragedy, Uncle Bob? Well, of course, um, we did sue uh, civilly. Uh, we Yes. It doesn't mean that the family will have to step in the courtroom, mm -hmm. but that's extremely important. Um, so we were uh, victorious in that respect, all because, again, of the video. Mm -hmm. Had there not been no video, uh, of course, they would have argued, which they did really argue in a way that, um, like Rodney King, what we saw didn't occur the way that we seen it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, Because Joe Hunter's Bessie claimed that Oscar Grant was reaching for a weapon. You know, Oscar Grant was shot uh, by Joe Hunter's Bessie because Joe Hunter's Bessie claimed that Oscar Grant was reaching for a weapon. You know
let you leave, uh, Uncle Bobby. I know that there is an event or in uh, that that's being organized. Do you want to let our listeners know about that? And I believe that is on August twenty second. Uh, 24. 24. Yeah. Um, one of the Oscars play sisters who is um, like a niece to me, and uh, oh, I'm quickly here, I'm sorry. Uh, everyone in the community calls me Uncle Bobby now. My name is actually Stephen uh, Johnson, but uh, officially known now to the community as Uncle Bobby. <laughs> uh, I like I'm that. All righty. Uh, so I just walk with that. I don't take it away. You know, all these young men and um, young females or my nieces and my nephews today, if I can speak on their behalf. Uh, so much love goes out to all of them, and you know, and I appreciate uh, being their uncle. Uh, but in regards to the um, event that we have going on, uh, uh, Ariel, uh, which is her name, uh, put together this play that's called um, Love Bomb, My Spirit Child. And in this particular play, she has it's a healing process where she has the actual mother, or an actor plays the mother, and an actor plays um, the child that was murdered. Um, uh, they're actually really um, discussing the relationship of these two persons um, in this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So in our case, it's my mother, Oscar's grandmother, and of course Oscar, because my mother, um, Oscar's grandmother had a very close relationship to Oscar. So not just was it a loss to, you know, Oscar's mother, my baby sister Wanda, but of course it was a loss to his grandmother, his uncle, his sister, his cousin, you know, his family, and then of course his friends. Uh, and so this is a, a, a dynamite play because it shares really emotionally, uh, like the movie, this travesty of losing a loved one just by way of understanding the relationship that we have with each other. And, uh, you know, as you know, of course, the movie um, shares our relationship with Oscar. It humanized Oscar. It shares with the world who Oscar was as a character in this world. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Uh, yeah. And so anyhow, that is on August the 24th um, at the Bluebell Park Station. Mm. Again, where Oscar was killed. We do sites I like that. Well, Jamal, who is our community black nationalist here in Boston and represents and deals with the very same issues such as yours, has a question and then we have to move on into our next segment. But before I let you go, on behalf of Jimmy Myers and myself, Sunshine, I'd like to thank you for calling in and, and letting us know so much about what you've been through as a family and again the condolences that we share here in Boston for your family we want you to know that they're real and true go ahead Jamal uh, sir uh, once again sorry for your loss my question is uh, it can there, is there any action that can be taken about uh, this judge I know here in Boston we have a very kind of a uh, uh, weird system that they have for judicial review but is there any way that you know there can be a complaint filed on this judge because it seems to me in your uh, 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 narrative of the story that he kind of tried to stack the deck and purposely tried to damage the case and certainly overstepped his his uh, uh, job of being a judge and supposed to be impartial so is there any action that can be taken away uh, on the judge and then the other thing too is uh, if I'm correct I, Oscar had a daughter as well, and, and if that's correct, um, can you please tell us how, how's the baby girl doing? Sure. Uh, uh, quickly, on the action toward the judge, um, you know, when we were just black, uh, my sister Wanda Oscar's mother was with Barbara Lee, a congresswoman, Barbara Lee, here in the state of California, in Washington, D.C., speaking to the Congressional Caucus. And one of the things that we consistently talk about is how uh, this judge really sabotage the case. Right. And, um, and, and, you know, I'll see this part, and then I'll finish that. Um, right at the ending of the hearing, the judge told us, my God, this is not about race. We gave you a black president. You know, this was the judge. Oh, 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 oh. He said this in the courtroom. He said that they gave us a black president. Oh, you my gosh. Make the point that this was about race. Oh, my gosh. We have a black president, you know. But anyhow, hmm. um, 
Take a break. We'll be right back. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, 617-445-1061 to Brother Musa. I hope you're still listening. Our time got short, and we know that you wanted to have a conversation with Uncle Bobby or at least ask a question. Send your condolences. He will be calling back in at a later date and time. Currently, we are shifting our gears. A lot of what Uncle Bobby talked about in Oscar Grant's death had to do with the district attorney. And I have three brothers in studio with me right now uh, who had the opportunity to hear what our own district attorney, Suffolk County, Dan Conley, and also mayoral candidate, had to say last night at Flames. And so I'll ask them all to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they've seen and heard. Uh, good morning, audience. Uh, I want to uh, first thank uh, Sunshine and Jimmy Myers. My name is Greg Walton. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity last night to, uh, to be with uh, these other young brothers in studio yesterday to hear uh, the DA uh, talking. And a lot of uh, uh, what we've kind of already talked about before is uh, how the response directly to the community uh, does show the perceivance of arrogance. It does show that uh, when they're challenged on questions from people who actually have some intelligence and actually know what's going on, um, they're a bit thrown off by that. And uh, I, ha I happen to, uh, to be a part of uh, the rally yesterday that uh, Jamal put together and then also uh, get a chance to run to uh, Vine Street yesterday uh, to be a part of, you know, Tito Jackson and other uh, members of the community coming together, Councilor Tito Jackson, excuse me. Um, so, I mean, my direct response is, is exactly what we've already heard versus just hearing that arrogance of letting us be a part of things or letting us come to people's offices or people giving us opportunity rather than it being that uh, they work for us. And, and now let's, let's hear my, from uh, Cornell. Th thank you, Sunshine. Uh, my name is Cornell Mills. I'm a, a lifetime resident of Boston. And just to, just to uh, sum up some of the events that took place yesterday, um, it was an action-packed day. We went from City Hall Plaza to a community meeting at Vine Street to a mayoral's forum um, down at, over in Grove Hall at Flames. And what, the, the, what came out of the meeting at Flames and the conversation that took place with D.A. Dan Conley was just a level of disregard for any questions involving race. Uh, race is, is, is the hot-button issue that's really going to 
decide and determine uh, how the next mayor proceeds and acts. So but this, we'll get into that a little bit well, later. No, as far but this as the is a post-racial society. Well, Boston you know. has resolved its racial tensions and issues. You know, the United States has <laughs> resolved their racial tensions and issues because we have a black president, Jamal. See, the thing with uh, Dan Conley and others is uh, what we talked about uh, a bit earlier is these people, when they get into office and they, 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 they get a, a sense about themselves is really warped and, and, and not based in reality. But it really speaks to uh, the word that has been applied to this A-Rod thing, arrogance. So I want to say for me as a taxpayer, citizen, voter, Dan Conley last night, because see, I used to work at City Hall when he was a counselor. And see, so unlike this new spin uh, that, that he's put on himself and recreated himself into a kinder, gentler Dan Conley. See, I was there and I saw him on the city council when Dapper O'Neill was there, when Jim Kelly was there, when Mickey Roach was there. And I know uh, the type of uh, uh, white man who is emboldened when he's surrounded by other white men. See, because, see, the thing that we have to understand is lynch, mob. There was a mob mentality there that they covered each other in their numbers and they were able to pull off some of the most racist, crazy type of stuff. And that's the type of situation we have in this city. When Dan Conley feels emboldened to disregard and disrespect our community, and particularly my brother Cornell and myself, personally disrespected me last night and even though I've disagreed with that man I've always been respectful to him that will cease that ceased last night so now all bets are off all guns are blazing because now Dan Conley lost my respect as a man he certainly didn't wasn't gonna get my vote before he certainly ain't getting it now and and on top of that I'm now gonna use the little bit of bully pulpit that I got through the Blackstonian with 15,000 people in my network not only has he lost my vote I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that other people do not vote for Dan Conley and know the type of arrogant disrespectful cocky white man that he is six one seven four four five one zero six one jamal and cornell and i'm sorry greg well. greg you know it, it it i need to know exactly how you were personally disrespected jamal need to stand up for this and and, and cornell um we want to hear from 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 you as well. Uh, let, let, let's let yeah, set Cornell the, set go the table. I'll, I'll, I'll start and go specifically into the two questions that I asked D.A. Dan Conley. First, uh, out of full disclosure, I let the entire audience know that I used to work at the district attorney's office. I was a homicide investigator. I was uh, an investigator in the juvenile unit. And um, I have some inside uh, history with the office. So I've, I've seen I've seen a lot more than most. Um, the two questions I asked in particular, first was focused on diversity. I asked him, what does the leadership look like in your office? How many people of color do you have in positions of power within your office? The second question was focused on the fact that Boston has the lowest homicide clearance rate in the country. As a major city, almost 70% of the homicide victims in, the, in our city um, go unsolved meaning that the killers are still walking the streets. So my question to him was, how much, of, how much responsibility do you hold and take for, the, for, this, uh, for these issues? And also, what's your response? Greg, did you have any issues with Cornell's two questions? What was your perception of the questions being asked? Not necessarily the answers, but as a black man who lives in this city, what did you feel about those two questions that Cornell addressed to District Attorney Conley? I thought they were great questions. Um, I thought they were questions that, uh, again, we want to have answered, you know, particularly, you know, from people in our community. And I just feel like uh, immediately you could feel that there was that, oh, my God, here's somebody who clearly he knows and clearly he knows is in the know to what's going on. How am I going to answer this in front of in front of these people? And it was clear that thrown off. <laughs> setting of immediately the deterrent happened and the answers became everything but what was towards the questions. We're talking about people who are no longer uh, working there. What was it? Paula? I can't remember the person's name that he mentioned, but it was people who were no longer working there. So it completely set this table of 
I'm not going to answer your question, even though I realize that it was an intelligent question, and whether or not the people here realize that, I'm not going to answer that question. Even though it was a legitimate question from someone who worked with him. Well, uh, Cornell, as you mentioned, you were on the inside. You're not speaking out of turn, out of place. You were on the inside, correct? Uh, absolutely. You worked absolutely. in that office. That's correct. Am I correct? Absolutely. And, and, and see, to me, too, Tomorrow. once the question was asked, Dan Connolly's demeanor visibly changed. Okay, and this is exactly what happens in the community meetings in our community when I talk about Menino and the BPD, all that. When they go to South Boston, it's sympathetic and empathetic and oh, oh, huggy feely, touchy. Then they come to our community and it's accusatory and aggressive. And well, you people, and if and if you people would talk to the police, then we could stop these crimes. And if you people did this and would take care of your children, it becomes that type of zone. And so last night when Dan Conley was asked that question, you could see his demeanor physically change. Uh, I believe two little horns popped out of the front of his head and he started really talking uh, very disrespectfully, not about the question, as Cornell came up and said in full disclosure, then he says well, if we're going to have full disclosure in full disclosure, I let you go and right. told the whole room yes. that he basically fired this man, mm -hmm. which is not an accurate uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, depiction of the facts, number mm -hmm. one. Why, why would that not matter? Accurate. Tell, me, tell, tell us why that's not accurate. Well, the, the story of, of my departure from the DA's office is a, is a long one. It's worthy of a movie. So <laughs> I don't want to get into one the details. One will be coming, <laughs> but it's not, like not like he said. It's not like he said. What I can tell you during my time there, I was the only black male who served in the position of investigator. And I found that working in a county and in a community where you're dealing with the majority of people of color, I was the single voice. There was a major disconnect between the office, the DAs, and, uh, and, and, the, and the public. And I served as a bridge uh, for that relationship. So my time there, I, I enjoyed it. I felt like it was very, very, uh, very well served. But there, there's a need to diversify every level every position in the criminal justice system in the education system and that was really the focus of my question do you feel the need what what have your actions been to diversify your leadership so that it can reflect what this city looks like moving forward as the mayor because based on what what you've done in the past that's what that's what's going to give us a barometer for what you're going to do in the future as mayor so yeah basic basically he, yeah. Oh, oh, the, the movie's coming. <laughs> but I think Greg wanted to chime in about what, I think we should stay inflamed and become inflamed. He wanted to respond no. to what Cornell was yeah, saying. Yeah, that's immediately what I was saying of why, you know, the immediate response was, you know, I let you go. Why did it even matter? You know, if he's a taxpaying citizen or somebody who's going to, you know, be voting, obviously. Homeowner, business right, owner. Right, wants, wants to be involved. Why can't he ask those questions? That's one. But just more... Uh, more backing on and you two missed this because you guys had already stepped out and I stayed in there and you know immediately you all got mad and left I, I had to leave oh, right, look, right. Look, look, so, leave. so I stayed and, and, and as he's exiting uh, this is when you get a chance to see how race matters and how his perception of what he was walking into mattered he immediately identified and said well uh, some, some people were in conversation with him about what had just happened because it, it was a little heated and he responds and says, oh, well, you know, you have two individuals that their whole mindset was to come in and destruct things. And I said, I'm thinking about it like that's not what it was at all. It was one part. Right. I'm out. Why own two wives? I'm, I'm there physically saying here's somebody who intelligently spoke and, and posed two powerful and interesting questions that me as a citizen would want to know the answers to like oh wow i wish i thought of a question like that nothing of destruction and i think there was just already this pre-notion and perception of oh here comes trouble or here comes people that are going to cause a problem versus wow here's here's somebody that you know i should be looking to answer their question for no 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 and, and we didn't even get to the questions no. i asked no so so the questions that i asked him uh was one i said i i know in the past that you've had a uh, 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 off again or on again uh, relationship with Commissioner Davis. Sometimes you have agreed, sometimes you've disagreed publicly. Um, but there are many in our community who don't think that Ed Davis has done such a bang up job. And so why have you committed to say that you, you, if elected mayor, would keep Ed Davis? That was one question. The other question was 
was something that I've studied. Sunshine is very intimately uh, uh, related with this as well about the people who have been shot by the Boston police uh, uh, here in Boston, all of whom have been black, Latino, and Cape Verdean. All right. Now, uh, that's just a fact. He's been the DA since 2002, and by my count, every time there's a shooting of a black, Latino, and Cape Verdean person, and those are the only ones who were shot by Boston police with a gun that shoots a bullet. Not the pepper spray thing that was an accident at the Red Sox game. Not right tasing not the white guy who died in uh, police custody who had a respiratory uh, uh situation i'm talking about bang you're dead shot with a gun okay black latino k verdian in all of those cases he has found a uh, uh, return to finding of no wrongdoing all of them uh, that I know, except for one case uh, uh, that I don't even know if it was during his tenure. I need to actually check that number because in the history of Boston, the only officer who has been ever uh, found guilty of any wrongdoing related to the shooting of a black person uh, was Officer Sean West. And guess what, y'all? Drum roll. Drrr, he was a black Eight officer. 617-445-1061. The fabric of the black community. The phone lines are open. Please take this opportunity to have these conversations with Jamal, Greg, and Cornell. And as we have this discussion, you mentioned a few moments ago, Jamal, that all bets are off and that you have number one lost respect for the district attorney. As a man, as which, a man, a which, human being, I lost respect as for As a man, uh, because you, I don't believe that you have respected uh, the role that he's played in the position that he uh, oh, no, no, holds no. And, and, and has been elected to. But the question that I have is, you said that you're going to take every 15,000 people or over 15,000 people in your network to do everything in your power to not have him elected. We know money in politics, and Cornell, you, any one of you all can chime into this. Money in politics. How does, because you also said this morning, you ain't got no money, you don't have X amount of resources. How do you fight that battle when we see uh, District Attorney Conley's number of uh, advertisements that are on the radio. Let, let me jump on that real quickly. The most important way to, to fight that battle is with the truth. Uh, we have to get to the nuts and bolts of what's going on in this city. We have to be willing to address the racial makeup of this city and how it reflects um, in City Hall. This is the most important election we've had in 20 years. So unless we dig deep and really take out the fine tooth comb and figure out who these people are and why they feel like they deserve our vote, uh, we're doing all of our, we're doing ourselves a disservice because it's going to reflect uh, in, in contracts, in jobs, in education. It's going to reflect all across the board. And if we want to see some improvement, we've got to take this election very seriously and make sure that we look very closely at everyone running so that we can decide who is going to best serve us in the future. And, and see, I want to say this too because see, I'm a fair guy. So, and, and being about the facts and whatnot, let me tell you a couple of things. One, uh, my friend, uh, you remember I had dreads, my good friend Kareem Ali, many of y'all knew out there as King Beef. King Beef was murdered in 2004. That's why I cut my dreads, right? Um, Dan Conley's office handled that case excellent. There's a couple of compelling factors there. Uh, Kareem was uh, murdered outside of a bar called Antua Newell, which is in Kenmore Square. Uh, the person fled the scene, going to Chelsea, and got caught on the bridge. So you had a pretty layup case right there because the person was caught with witnesses, uh, probably at least 30 witnesses. So he handled that case with, with care, and uh, and his victim witness assistant people uh, uh, helped out. So that, that was wonderful. Another thing about Dan Conley that I, I thought was good, when he came into office, uh, the DA... Uh, at that time, Suffolk County was number two in the nation for wrongful convictions under the previous DAs, Newman Flanagan and even Ralph Martin. Uh, Dan Conley did come in and uh, did a little bit of a cleanup. I don't know where the efforts are now. And that is what got uh, some brothers who were wrongfully convicted, wrongfully imprisoned out of the jail. So that's good. So see, I give credit where credit is due. What I'm talking about, though, too, in terms of his attitude last night on the campaign trail, if we were in the street, uh, I would say something else. But here on the radio, I would just say,
just say he acted like a punk. That was some punk business what he did last night. And if he's a grown man and a politician and a prosecutor who has to go into court and all that and couldn't handle those two little, it wasn't even tough questions. Those are softball questions. Then, and if he couldn't handle those questions from us two people, then he got no business in this uh, in this game. We're going to go to the callers. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I am very thrilled to see and hear you guys having these type of discussions. It has been long overdue. But I think when you have a platform and a stage to present these people that are running for this mayor of this city, it is important for you guys to point out their flaws because they will do that to you if you were running. Absolutely. I read a story yesterday that they did in regards to Charles, how the things that he's doing with his radio station. And here's a man that has stood up uh, from time and time again in our community that we live. I think when you listen to what Brother Charles has done, um, it is important to understand that when anybody's running for an office, if there is someone out there that can relate to what you and I go through, these are the people that I want to give my vote to. Because these are the people who knows what it is to be in the position that we face every day living in these parts of Boston. And when a crime takes place, the same treatment you give it, whether it took place in the South End, whether it took place in Brookline, it's the same type of treatment you have to give it if it takes place in either Rockbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, or any of these surrounding areas. And the, the young man who is speaking as far as working in the office, I think Mr. Connolly got the sense it's only because someone is now calling out the type of character that he carries, and now he wants to run for a political office and shows that he has done the things to help this community as well as the type of person he, he, he is not. Well, thank you. Caller, we actually have to take a quick break. We appreciate your calls. I think what we need to do, Jimmy, is have these three brothers and mm -hmm. sprinkle a little bit of a sister in here somehow with the activism and organizing that we're doing in our community uh, back in uh, and, and right away and earlier in the morning uh, because I think that will bring more of our listeners into the discussion. We're going to come back and then we have to close it out, find out about the action that will be taken uh, following up on the rally uh, yesterday. 617-445-1061 and they talk about black men don't do nothing in our community and there ain't no <laughs> good black men doing stuff for us or wanting to see change. Y'all are listening and you hear it and you feel it. I'll be back, and I'm staying black. Power. Say you will, say you will be with us tomorrow. <laughs> then got hot up in here, the mom standing up like he about to do a two-step or a one-two. I don't know who he's about to knock out. Cornell's ready to roll <laughs> on out the dough. Jimmy is over there in the other studio. Jimmy has his own little special, special seat over there. And uh, Greg... We can't thank you enough for popping in uh, today. I know uh, we want you to tell us really what it is that you do and how you're a part of the movement more in an uh, engineering technology type way. So good morning again. My name is Greg Walton. Uh, I'll first start off by saying, you know, I am a 28-year-old uh, uh, child of God, um, and I'm just, you know, thankful for the opportunity. Uh, I am. I grew up in Boston, you know, Dorchester, Roxbury. I played, you know, little league uh, baseball in Talbot Ave, Upper Roxbury, North Dorchester League. Um, so, and I, and I love the community. Um, I am, as you mentioned, I'm a, a IT guy at uh, MIT. I've been doing that for about six years. Um, but even more 
towards the, the movement. Um, I'm an alum of a program uh, that was founded in Boston in 2000 called Year Up, uh, which works with the uh, uh, urban young adults in the community, uh, primarily, you know, Dorchester, Roxbury, you know, Mattapan, and, and a lot of the cities that are dealing with a lot of the issues that we've talked about. Um, and I'm also the first alum of the program to join its uh, National Board of Directors. Um, as well as uh, they've, uh, they're in uh, about 10 cities now. Um, so, um, and I'm, I just recently got uh, elected to the uh, Boston Reentry Initiative Advisory Board, uh, which works with uh, the Suffolk County House of Correction uh, and the Boston Police Department uh, in helping people transition uh, from, you know, South Bay House of Correction and uh, obviously Concord and all those, you know, different situations of dealing with uh, uh, being in the system. Um, so I'm, I'm just here in this movement of, you know, trying to change this community and I'm on a different stage of trying to hold uh, young people accountable and making a difference in the community themselves. Tomorrow, Jimmy, tomorrow. My final thoughts are, uh, first of all, thank you, Cornell. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Greg. We will begin this conversation and open up the dialogue again uh, at 8 o'clock a.m. tomorrow morning. And to my black brothers and my black community and all of my blackness, I want to say that uh, we are um, dismantling the myth that black men of Boston, from Boston, born, raised, and reared here, mentored by men who have pioneered the way and are in the movement, and it is not a moment that we um, have to spare. So I want to thank you all for everything that you do, and including, you know, you, Jimmy, and, 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 and bringing awareness to the issues and pushing that envelope uh, of, of of meeting power right at its seat and uh, pretty much knocking people over. And so I say thank you to that. And within that spirit, I say that whatever it is that I can do, because in my feminine type of way, I'm a different kind of um, uh, activist than a male, but I want to have a seat and be able to at least share everything that you all are doing by way of Blackstonian. And before tomorrow, Jamal, my final question to you is, will our listeners at least have the opportunity to see and hear a little bit of what happened? Are you going to post any kind of video about the exchanges Working so that, that we can uh, monitor that tonight and be able to uh, accurately discuss it from the, like you said, when you see something from a distance, you have an opinion that might uh, open it up, and then we have to we're, let Jimmy work us out. We're working on the video for the uh, from the rally, so that should be up today. Cornell also will have the video. Yeah, we're getting the video from the forum last night. I'm well, um, in that exchange, so we will have that available. Blackstonian.com. Blackstonian.com. I'll make sure you guys get the link to it. And, and my final words is no on Conley, dirty Dan. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me just wrap up behind that note. You know, my my name is Cornell Arrogant Mills. So and so, a great. I'm I'm a, I'm a child of the civil rights movement, and I'm I'm raising my children with the same awareness, consciousness, and eye on social justice. Um, that that's a lifetime mission. This isn't about today or tomorrow. This is a lifetime mission to move the football a couple of yards. So.